Africa, transhumanism and the magic mushroom. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here for the first time in South Africa. I came all the way from Detroit, Michigan. Welcome! Been trying to get down this far in Africa for several decades, so uh, this conference was just uh, uh, heaven sent. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizers, everyone, the ladies standing at the door, the security at the front, the tax people, everybody. So, since I only have a little bit of time, this is a four hour presentation, and I only have an hour, I'm gonna run through some things very quickly. But since being here at the conference, uh, my talk has changed just a little bit. I'm still getting to the transhumanistic part of it, but I just wanted to address a few of the things that were said earlier, basically during Julian's talk. And it talked about, uh, with, it talked about the, the difficulty, the problems of the mindset of the West, and how I want to actually try to look at this is from a, a, a early advantage point. I think uh, folks were talking about the time of Rome, um, but this goes back much further, the problems of the psyche of the West. And it goes back to when prehistory was it was the claim to fame. It was prehistoric. It's a prehistoric problem. It's not a modern problem. And we can't solve it in a modern way because we can't fix the problem if you don't understand really where the problem came from. And it's called the Iceman's Inheritance. And what that is is that the people of Europe were trapped in the last ice age. And there's a difference between what they call the northern crater and the southern crater. And being trapped in the ice age, fear was paramount. Meaning that the basic problem of the man of the West is fear of starvation. And I believe that Khalil Gibran said, is not fear of thirst when your well is full a thirst that is unquenchable. <clears throat> Meaning that nothing will ever be enough. No amount of money, no amount of pleasure, no amount of science and understanding will ever fill the void of that infancy in the ice. And that's really what it's about. Let me put a scenario together for you. If you have in the north, in Europe, a group of people who are a family living together. At that time, polyandry was practiced. In other words, several men in a setting with maybe one or two women. And we, we juxtapose that to the south where polygamy was in the forefront. Children were a blessing. Abundance was there. It even goes into the way we, we regulate time between people who are in the southern crater or island people and the people of the north. So why would you only want two women if you're in the north? Because if you have too many women, what happens? If you have too many children. If you have too many children, what happens? Too many miles to feed. So what they used to do was they would take the girl children. If a boy children were born, you would take the boy child, and he'd be with you to help hunt, to help defend the home from hostile animals, hostile, other hostile families who want to take what you have because they're in the same predicament, a lack of food. But if you had a girl child, you'd say, oh man, another girl, what are we going to do? They take the girl children out and either just let them die in the ice or feed them to the wolves and things like this because you couldn't have too many women. And if it's a little boy, you know, until he's established himself, they said you'd have sex with him too. Because he couldn't protect himself because mammals are organized in the male down in the sirens. 
those with the strongest muscles, the longest fangs, rule. They impose themselves on everybody else. So you have this difference in the way things are seen as far as the earth is concerned. You're not looking at the earth as a loving mother who is providing us with everything that we need. If you're on Fiji, or what the uh, other presenter was saying when he was in Bali, he said he walked around for months and food was everywhere, just a bit. Mangoes and ice cream, but I didn't even know it was ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> If you get it cold, it's probably going to be great. <laughs> warm ice cream. But in the, in the southern cradle or in places, island people, you would have abundance. Children are a blessing. The world is good. Our rituals are to invoke the sun to come back. Please come back. On bended knees, sun, please come back. Sun worship in the vein of the sun, if it doesn't come back, we're gonna have a problem in a couple of months because we're gonna starve to death. Time was different between the southern brave people and the people of Europe. That's why today, when you have a job, the biggest thing is being on time. The job at eight o'clock, Bob, why weren't you at your desk at eight o'clock? And that's why when the conquistadors and, you know, let's use that blank term, when they moved out of Europe into other places and they wanted other people to work, they say, well, these people don't have to work yet. They're lazy. You know, we told Bob to be here at 8 o'clock and it's 11 now. Because they didn't have the same type of work ethic because trapped in the Ice Age, you have a very short planting season once you understand how to plant. Meaning that, okay, September 14th is the day that we got to plant. We got to make sure these plants are in, in line and we got to make sure they survive because we only got a very short growing season. So you got to be on time. But in the southern cradle, you know, hey, you want to plant something this year? <laughs> let's, let's, I mean, let's do it next year. You know, just grab a couple of mangoes, a couple of bananas. You know, we're doing what we feel like because you can plant any time of the year if you want to plant. Or you can just eat the fruit that's available. It had to do with lack. If you were one of those guys in the house with the other 15 guys and two women, and everybody sitting around cold, around a little fire, and you went out, hey, you walk five kilometers out to the frozen river. You had your trusty rock and your trusty sharpened stick. And you sit there for two hours and you broke the ice. Then you stayed there for another four hours waiting for a fish to, get, to come. And when you finally caught a fish and you went back home and you stand there with your fish, and there's 17 other people there saying, hmm, that's a nice fish, George. <laughs> Aren't you going to share? <laughs> George says, no, this is my fish. Nobody can have it. If you come over in this corner where I'm at with this fish, I'm going to kill you. Whereas George in the southern cradle says, hey, you want to go fishing? Yeah, let's get this, let's put together the fishing song, get everybody together, we'll get the canoes together, we'll put 50 canoes out of there, we'll beat the water, and women can have the traps, and we'll drive 10,000 fish to the shore and have a big feast. You, oh, George, you're trying to eat fish, yeah, I'm trying to eat fish, what about you? Oh man, what are we going to do all the rest of this fish? I don't know. But, doesn't matter. Because we got so much food, it's not a big deal. So when the Europeans came out with Iceman's inheritance to the rest of the world, they brought that type of mentality. The indigenous people miscalled Indians in the United States. When the Europeans first came to the United States, they welcomed them in. 
They gave them food. They made sure Thanksgiving in the United States was because they were starving to death and eating each other and the Indians came and gave them food. This is the problem. And I'm not going to say that to be disrespectful, but this is just what it is. If we're not going to be truthful, then it doesn't even matter to say the things that we say. You can't deal with the problem until you understand what the problem is. It's fear of starvation. And it is in the genes. This went on for 30,000 years. After that, the same type of mentality. So, when we look at things like ayahuasca, and you call it medicine, you know, and this medicine, this medicine plant, and the heal, things like that, I'm here to speak about mushrooms, hallucinogenic mushrooms. Mushrooms are not medicine. Mushrooms are magic. small caveats to give to you before I really start into my presentation. And that's, it's not arrogance of what I do, trying to take higher and higher doses. I'm not encouraging anybody to take a higher dose than you feel is necessary for you to do whatever you need to do. Because I've been called irresponsible. What reason would you have to take 30 grand? <laughs> when I get inside of my, my presentation, why I think that the next level of human existence will be pushed several different ways, but two major ways. It will be an organic singularity and a technological singularity. Yeah. And you have people like Ray Kurzweil, Hugo de Guerres, has more of it, and others who are part of the singularity movement who are held bent having conferences. You paid a, I don't know, a hundred grand in here, I don't know how much it is in dollars, but their conferences are 1,500 US, you know, elite conferences on the technology of the emergence of human consciousness with the machine. They're held in, moving forward. Talking about downloading into computers, speeding up the processes, slowing it down, becoming immortal inside of that. And then you have the tech, that technological singularity, and you have what I call organic singularity. Because I'm uh, a fan of somewhat of the stone egg theory, I believe this is what helps <laughs> bring us into the human consciousness. And that goes back, they may find them every year. But actually the oldest one is down at the cave. And it's twice as old as anything in Europe. It's 100,000 years old, right down the road here. But that's not popularized, or it's not said, because Africa is always marginalized. When they talk about hallucinogens, even up to a very recent point, they say that Africa is sparse in hallucinogens. Africa has the most undiscovered hallucinogens than any place on the earth. This is still headquarters, regardless of what folks think, because this is where the human form comes from. This is where the role of the soul is. This is where the two arms and two legs and a head standing upright comes from. <laughs> because everything else died off. We were contemporaneous with Homo habilis and Homo erectus. Man goes back millions of years. We just haven't found the things yet. So you can't say, oh, seven million years. But every single year, they push it back. So let me move into my talk. Officially, there's other, a couple other things I want to hit along the way, but I want to move through this quickly. So thank you for your attention. And uh, as I don't know if you all know was a city on hall? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, he's back on TV. He's a, 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 a host in the United States. He kicked off 
TV for about 20 years and back on, but he used to say in his first rendition of his show, he used to say, let's get busy, so right now let's get busy. <laughs> It is my contention and the contention of many others who have taken the high dose of psilocybin mushroom that this is a organic extraterrestrial technology that directed panspermia pushed by solar winds inside the comets deposit spores which are one of the hardest things in nature approaching the hardness of metal percolated through comets, asteroids, into different solar systems, getting to a planet that is hospitable, finding the right temperature, the right food they sprouted, finding a entity that can utilize the information that was encoded in it, in it because there's something that uh, came out basically in the New Age. The New Age was started by uh, Madame Lavasque and the Theophilus in the 19th century. And they talked about Akashic records, but it is the records of the Acacia or the records of DMT, which are hyperdimensional, extra dimensional, extraterrestrial. And these records span the galaxy. So, you know, this is theory like anybody else's theory is just as valid as the Big Bang. <laughs> That's a theory. Changing in the parallel universes. There's a lot of theories about the Big Bang is the one that uh, they put in the textbooks or the next, you know, for 50 or 60 years or so. You know, Darwinism, theory, 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 theories. It's just as valid. You know, if you say the Earth is four million years, you calculate time by the Earth's movement around the sun. And you say, the universe is 14 billion years old. How will you calculate time before you have Earth to go around the sun to be able to say that it was 14 billion years ago? Because you didn't have Earth, you didn't have the sun 14 billion years ago. So it's a theory. We're going to be talking about uh, the Tesla plateau each year. But as I said before, these aren't the oldest cave paintings that exist. The oldest cave paintings that we have records of on the earth are right down the road at, uh, just right down the road here. I'm the other reading. And I don't usually read things in my presentation, but just real quick, because I'm not good with, with, with the, the names here of how you call the different places. But it says 100,000 year old art workshop discovered in South Africa. You all know about that, right? Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah. At the uh, Palombo's Cave. Number. Yeah. They didn't just find the painting, they found the, the, the art studio with pallets, with the, with the ochre paint in them, in shells. So they push it back twice with that which was found in Europe as far as the cognitive understanding of man and how he became truly cognitively man. They had jewelry. They had an evolution of the things that were from before, so they were truly modern human beings. What we're going to talk about, because of my slides have the Tassili Plateau, since that's the oldest, at this particular time that we found, renditions of mushroom use on Earth. Man's relationship with cattle, because these mushrooms are prophylic, meaning that they like to grow on dung. That's their thing. Elephant dung, camel dung, cow dung. But since Man domesticated cattle, and he hasn't got around to domesticating elephants and other things. He kind of brought the mushrooms in the backyard. So these were some of the paintings, going back to seven, nine thousand years old. Um, I had some, uh, some video, but we don't have enough time to go through those. Uh, here we have what they call mushroom shamans. And I'm not really a shaman turned person because 
challenges come from Siberia, and I believe people should be called what they are. If you are a, a, a Kung Fu, if you are a Babalao, if you are in Sangoma, I believe you should be called that. But now this is a new term for anybody who's not a rabbi or a imam or a priest. It's, I guess, more politically correct to call them a shaman than it is the witch doctor or the medicine man, you know, or the hoodoo person. <laughs> but these are mushroom-headed people. The people prove what they saw under the influence of Hallucinism. And we know that there was a difference because I believe Pablo Picasso, when he saw these renditions on the wall, said that we have created nothing. Because these paintings were correct in usage and color and all these different types of things dealing with the animals that they saw in nature and produced and reproduced those on the cave walls. And then when they produced those other things under the influence, they produced what they saw. At a time when no person on earth had a pair of shoes, not even sandals, they were drawing people with helmets and boots. Now you just don't wake up one day and say, hey, I want to draw a guy with some boots on. You don't have any, you don't have any conception of what a boot is. That's like one day they sit around, every house on earth is uh, a hole in the ground or in a cave or some sticks tied together, and you just walk out one day and say, you know what, George? Let's build a pyramid. <laughs> and Mike says, not you, Mike. <laughs> Mike says, what's a pyramid? You say, well, it's a, you take a square and you bring it together in the middle and you bring it up so high so that it stands up and doesn't fall down. So well, how are we going to do that? Let's take some mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> But mushrooms is the way that they conceptualize how to produce pyramids, technically, these types of edifices, temple style hall temples. There was no pattern for these types of things. What they did was the pre chromatic the pre the pre chromatic Keshet is the name for Egypt, pre-Egyptian priests, pre-dynastic Egyptian priests going into novel states of consciousness, observed in the compendium of those novel states of consciousness, how one family chose to clothe themselves in reality, and that is called the family of Ra. Ra, Aset, Nebhet, Haru, What they saw in light in those realms, once they came out of their trip back to normal waking consciousness, they produced in stone what they saw in light in those areas of sojourn in those states of consciousness. Meaning that if you saw a pyramid in light, and, oh, when I get back, I'm going to make one. So let's make it out of stone. <laughs> because they have a lot of stone. <laughs> <laughs> these are the dancing shots. We're going to move through these quickly. Dancing with mushrooms in the hands. This is what they believe the mushroom to be. It's kind of hard to see. They call it psilocybin marii. We call it tamarian blue. This is the bee shine. And I believe this is the re rendition of Cat, uh, the ex-wife of Terrence McKenna. This is an actual cave painting, but I have one right behind it, which is an actual um, photograph of the cave painting. You can just actually see this one better and how it was rendered because of, uh, you know, because she grew it. It's easy to see. The other one is wearing, wearing out. 
As I said before, these mushrooms are graphitic. They grow on down. This one's called uh, hippopotamus. You know, you know I, mean, I think they really like the hippopotamus, so there's quite a bit of it. <laughs> now, let me set this up real quick because it goes into the Sahara. The Sahara is now desert and it's encroaching into the arable land in Africa, I mean, into the usable land in Africa. What happened is, even up until about 2,000 years ago, the Sahara was still useless. We know that because Pliny the Elder, Roman historian, said that the Sahara and Egypt was the breadbasket of Rome. It drove Roman soldiers. It kept them moving because this is where they got the grain from. Here in Egypt. That was the whole thing with Caesar, Mark Anthony, and others coming into Egypt because of the grain ship they wanted because Cleopatra and her brother, or Cleopatra the Eighth, because there were eight Cleopatras. Cleopatra the Eighth and her brother were feuding, and the grain wasn't flowing the way it should. So that's why Mark Anthony and Caesar came and wanted to chastise them about the grain that moved. But we know that the Sahara was still green up to about 2,000 years ago. It had been coming drier and drier over a period of many years. When the hunters and gatherers on the Sahara moved from the great forest of Africa, because the Africa was a great jungle forest from the top all the way down here. Climactic changes came and things became drier and drier and drier. Now, when you start with mushrooms, because this was the thing that everybody anticipated. In other words, if you had a, a family group of 70 hunters and gatherers, and they were out gathering. The mushroom would ask you to pick it because it was visible. You know, it looked like it. I, I didn't want it, I was, I was hungry. <laughs> you, you try it, you know, you like it, you try it, you don't like it. But the mushroom in the psilocybin genus is an adaptive advantage for human beings. At low doses, it imparts visual acuity. In other words, it makes you see better. So there would be a hunter and gatherer and there's a, a, a flower that has a tube around it a hundred yards away and you're 150 yards away. If you took psilocybin, you could still see it but your vision was only contained within a hundred yards. In martial art, in which my first uh, areas of mushroom use were, 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 were inculcated into me through martial arts, all martial arts, ancient martial arts, traditional martial arts, use Allocentrism. That includes the, the Shaolin Temple, you know, they used the Amanitas. How else do you think they were flying all over the place and, you know, <laughs> got a hundred, a hundred spears come out of me, blocks all over his shirt? <laughs> they were mushrooms. <laughs> Shaolin means young forest, young pine forest where the mushrooms grow, where we get our power. What do you think when the guy did <laughs> projecting his chi at the other kung fu master from the rival school and he... <laughs> That's because they were mushrooms. <laughs> Same thing as the past. I know all of you know that Ninjitsu came out of mushrooms. The Tingle type. The Goblin Mushroom. The goblin mountain mushroom. The mountain goblin demons came down when they were in Indonesia, Sila, connected to mushrooms. In India, Kalari Payet, coming from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, utilized Soma, which was the mushroom blue, blue. That was originally the blue mushroom. It was changed to the red mushroom when Gordon Watson said it was the red mushroom. But that was a whole smoke, CIA smoke screen. We're getting to that and get a chance. This is metonetic, what they call hieroglyphics. And what we have here is writing, picture, picture writing. You're here. But that's not the secret of what Kemet is because Kemet was built on mushrooms. It was built on the mushrooms drying up in the Sahara. Because what was the significance of ancient Kemet? 
What was the significance of ancient Egypt? The significance was that it was the only available water source in the desert, the Nile River. That's what created the city-state. It brought everybody together in one spot. But before that, when, you, when the Sahara was still green, you didn't have to be in that one spot. You didn't have to have a big city where everybody crowded on top of each other. Because you could go here, there's water, there's water, every place there's water. But when the Sahara started drying up, and people started to moving, they started to move to the only available water source, and that was the Nile River, and that built that civilization. Now, when the mushrooms started drying up on the Sahara, there was a time when this whole room would have mushrooms, and we'd have a shared experience. We sit down around the fire, knock down 20 grams, <laughs> pour a big drink. And in the middle of the fire, a being descends into the middle of the fire, steps out, he has the head of a bird in the body of a man. His name is Haru. And Haru says, you know, if you all go to the mountain, you'll find good food. But only stay there a week until they're going to be a big flood. Then you say, okay, well, we're going to try this out. They go, they find the food, they leave there the flood. Okay, well, this guy's good. <laughs> Everybody knows it. <laughs> because we've all experienced it. It's an experience. It's not a belief. But when the mushroom dried up, we couldn't use them at all. When the mushroom dried up, everybody couldn't use them. So what happened is, okay, hey, we'll get the oldest guy, the oldest lady, we'll give them the 20 grams, and then they'll tell us what Peru said. Which way to go? How to avoid floods? How to find food? And they would come back and tell the rest of the group that Haru said, we need to go west. They said, well, if Haru said go west, we're going west. <laughs> and that was good for that generation, because that generation had the experience. That generation knew that there was a Haru because they saw him uh, as Haru. The African mindset doesn't distinguish between what you call natural and supernatural. It's no difference between the two. What you experience is real. There's no such thing as a hallucination. <laughs> so, when those two people took the mushroom and let everybody else know it was good, when those people started dying out, and only the two people were taking the mushroom, and the next generation came, and they said, Haru said, let's go west. And they're like, who's Haru? Who's Haru? <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, he's the guy who has a bird head and a man's body, and he comes out and sends out of the sky in the fire, and steps out of the fire and tells us which way to go. And they're like, yeah, you know, it's, it's 10,000 BC, but I got a bridge in Brooklyn you can buy. <laughs> so it moved from a direct experience to a belief. And when those people moved into killing, the, normal, the regular people weren't taking hallucinogens. They weren't taking the acacia. They weren't taking the blue water lily. You know, they were smuggling lobium and had some boat going across in some coca leaves too. But the main hallucinogens for the highest priesthood was the psilocybin mushroom. And the psilocybin mushroom, when that became scarce, they, the psilocybin mushroom, taught them how to utilize the acacia and the Syrian group. It said that I can't be here with you, but this will get you through until I can come back in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> so what we have, this is the table of the food of the gods. These are mushroom caps because they're performing the ceremony of opening up the mouth of the Chris or the mummy. But you see a noop who is the embalmer, he's the one that leads you in that. The jackal takes the cane out of it and makes it like giving flesh. That's why jackal, they don't eat fresh meat. They want it to rot away. So as your, your physical body, your cock rocks, the jackal comes and gives it 
living flesh. It's all, all symbolic. But the secret is you have the mushroom lift. It's called the kabit, the shadow, the shade, the land of darkness, the land of potential. What a loop has here, the, the picture is a little bit brighter. You can see that what he's doing, he's holding a mushroom. He's holding the stem of the mushroom. This is the cap. It's superimposed mm. over in front of the mm. mm. And the reason why I take high doses is to become more than what I am. It's an exploration. It's a journey. It is a testing of my spirit and power against whatever comes, whatever forces come. My goal each time is to stand more and more and more. To take more and more and more. Now, the thing about suicide is that it has an L, a high LD50. Meaning that LD50 is this. How much of any compound can you eat 100 grams before it kills 50 of And the LD50 on psilocybin is approximately your body weight. Meaning that you have to eat your body weight in one setting to kill yourself <laughs> physically. Now that doesn't mean be irresponsible and sit up on the edge of that balcony <laughs> because you can't fall off to kill yourself. Or stand in the middle of traffic you know, if you're to knock down 10 grand or something like that. It doesn't mean you can't get killed. You want to be in a safe environment. And the dose that I'm talking about, you can't do anything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Australia and the guys are saying, hey, you know, yeah, we had some shrooms and, you know, we had some MDMA and we had some weed and, you know, we drove a bit of vodka and we, you know, we're in front of the TV and watch The Matrix and, you know. <laughs> watch The Matrix on five grand. <laughs> <That's not interesting. laughs> but the thing is, is that high school suicide, but you can't do nothing to lay down anyway, on the bed or on the floor. And hold on so you don't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> so the mushroom is superimposed over the mummy. Here it is. And then you also have the mushroom glyph in the seated Ansar or Osiris or Wasir, the Lord of the Dead. This is Mandala. I'll do some other things here. This is a Mandala, sand painting, the Tibetan sand painting on the ground. What happened is these are places, these are worlds, these are stargates. They took and three dimensionalized through a computer, this mandala, and when they put it, the algorithm through the computer to three-dimensionalize this two-dimensional two structure, it built this. It had stairs going into, because this is where the high Buddhists go and study in the hyperdimensional realm, while you sit down here trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to move real quick. The carpet. Did you know that the red dye in the Persian carpet is a Syrian root? Yeah. It is the signature for when you take the hallucinogen and sit on the carpet. And that carpet three dimensionalizes just as the mandala three dimensionalizes. So, it becomes a mnemonic device, a device of memory, Love. a device of journey. Meaning that people would take carpets and hold on to them generation after generation. Because the spirits of their ancestors lived in this part of the carpet. The unborn lived in this part of the carpet. The land of potential was in this part of the carpet. And so on and so forth, as many memories that you and your ancestors have and places that you and your ancestors go or strive to go to are included inside of this carpet. You take your hallucinogen at a high dose, sit on the carpet, and go into these different worlds. If you want to see your grandmother, you go and see your grandmother. If you want to see your teacher who has passed on, you go into the carpet and see your teacher who has passed on. That's the Syrian rule. You all know about that. MAO inhibitor. Anybody know what that is? That's the set of that puzzle box from heroin. You think it's a toy? You think heroin is a toy? Puzzles, labyrinths, caves are places. That's why I want to get down to this cave and knock down 
put it right up to my face. <laughs> because I've been in caves where the wall will become transparent. The characters animate. I'm going to go back real quick because I only got about five minutes. This. At five grand, you'll see that stuff wiggle on the wall. <laughs> With intent. Five grand for suicide. If you look at this picture, they'll yeah, wiggle on the wall. At 15 grand, these folks will come off the wall. <laughs> it's a DVD. <laughs> At 25 grand, you dissolve and go into the wall. <laughs> this is the technological legacy built by those who built the mushrooms. Because, as I said before, it's an organic technology. This is technology. This is technology. This is technology. This is Osiris, the Lord of the Dead, called Ansar, or Wasir. He is in his mummified, mushroom form. I put it inside the mushroom to show you. That's a mushroom. Disregard the arm. Disregard the head that was knocked out. And just take it what it is for what it is. Mm. Basic common sense. Doesn't have to be anything it's esoteric. The <coughs> maiden that lived through the heart, because they red. Got four chambers. You eat it. Basic common sense. The, ch the child is hot. We're going to move through this real quick. A circle within a circle. I laughed yesterday when I looked at. What's on the floor there? The um, crystals and stones that they make, but they make the exact same thing. This is the symbol of Ra, a circle within a circle. Here, the glyph reads Amen Ra, the circle within a circle. I'm going to move real quick here. These are ear studs showing that the people of Egypt understood each. Uh, Mushroom that were in the, the hallucinogenic mushroom that was in the area. That's the pioneer land. That's the great cow. Cow with blue spots. Blue, the Karelian blue. As a rich symbolic of pine tree, pine cone that's in the, uh, in the Vatican. That's the mushroom that, uh, found in the Vatican. That's Hari Hari holding the mushroom. Uh, and we go into all of the Indian traditions. That's Hanuman and Angi Hanuman, the hero of the Ramayana, holding his mushroom. And I get hold of this mushroom. With a mushroom. Um, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, we went up to uh, Ahura Mazda, the Akarai uh, Sisters, Shango in West Africa, the double headed axe with his lightning strikes, mushroom to grow. Uh, Thor, same thing, just up north. The Nine Worlds, I think it's coming out next week. Dark Elves. Dark uh, Elves. Yeah, uh, into dark, something it is. Okay, and I wanted to go into the tryptamines, um, uh, melatonin. Uh, this is psilocybin. Psilocybin is the stable form. It's 4 plus 4 oxy in it, and that's tryptamine. Psilocybin is DMT. I don't know why I'm going to keep saying, oh, it's very close to DMT. It's 4 plus 4 oxy in it, and that's tryptamine. When you eat it, it dephosphorylates, that top power falls off and becomes psilocin, which is less stable, but it's the Rolls Royce of. Uh, oh, I got it. I'm on there. Yeah. You eat the psilocybin, it knocks that top part off, becomes psilocin, and the only difference between, well, I, I'm going to get into the uh, methyl groups and the, the, the nitrogen groups on the, uh, in relationship to the methyl, but don't have time for that. But, you know, that's DMT. What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> that's oxygen molecule. That's one. DMT. 
It's the same thing. It's the only organic, ingestible DMT that you can get that we found out there. Everything else is an alchemy that is brain chemistry. It is an exogenous brain chemical as opposed to an endogenous brain chemical created by the pioneer plant. Ayahuasca is an alchemy. It came when people understood how to make fire and make a pot to hold water and then formulate, put two things together. You have a person who's in between the ayahuasca you drink and yourself. The person who made it, unless you make it yourself. There's nothing between you and this. Nature made it. And I'm not saying anything wrong about ayahuasca, I'm just saying that it's a newer system. The other things are newer systems. This was whole within itself when we encountered it on the grasslands of the Sahara a hundred thousand years ago. It was whole within itself. And the other ones, I know you know people like the little salvia, San Pedro, things like that, but that's not brain chemistry. The DMTs are brain chemistry. And these are uh, DMT synthesis, and I hold up to get into the uh, harmonies, harmonies, and finally, which can be produced in darkness. Mandachia has a center that he created in Thailand so that you can go in the dark. And that's what caves were. They were places to pump the DMT, pump the pineal. Because you no longer had light, you didn't have the, uh, the, the, the light and dark punctuation. Let's go through this real quick. Oh, no. This is um, Easter Island, but Lumen's Lumen of Big Statues was a job. <laughs> but you know something? They had mushrooms too. Oh, yeah. It's encoded. It wasn't for you people and me to know and understand. It was for an elite. And that's why in the 1950s, when Gordon Watson went to Maria Sedina and they set up the whole CIA 1960s culture, it got away from it. Because Aldous Huxley and Thomas Malthus and, Char uh, and, and Darwin, they were elitists, they were eugenicists. They wanted to decrease the population, have these things for them only. And I believe, I can't prove it, but I believe that's why Gordon Watson switched over to how many of the when I think he knew that it was suicide because the whole Indian effort is based around the cow and the reverence for the cow. And you can't get how many of the scary mushrooms from cow dung. You can't get suicide. Krishna's neck, Krishna is blue, just like this. And I wanted to talk about not the Mayan, not the Aztec, but the all men. But we don't have time for that. Moving through the last few. These are, these are masks, these are um, African masks that also scarification. Um, there's so much stuff on the, on the body, the scarification. We're not the tattoo people, we're the scarification people. But as I was saying the other night, tattoos, when they were given, were the person would be under the influence of the Indian, the person giving the tattoo. And the person who put the tattoo on the person had to put on what was there. He couldn't, he couldn't just, oh, well, let me be creative again. Make <laughs> no, he had to penetrate the vision, what was actually there, and reproduce that. And there was a kill of other tattooers. If you didn't reproduce what was there, they can see it because they take it, the Alison and say, Oh, you made a mistake. You didn't put this here. Thank you very much. I got a lot more, but.